This is episode 118 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 118 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have a slightly different episode for you. I have Aaron Mathur on the show. And Aaron, rather than many of our investors on this show that are really at the early stages of their investing, Aaron is actually winding up his real estate investing career after 30 plus years in the business. So Aaron is a wealth of knowledge. He came in and he talked about the ups and the downs. He survived the downturn in the 90s in the real estate market. And he shares his philosophy about how to be successful successful and how to spot coming changes in the market from his point of view. And I thought it was a really interesting episode. It's something that we haven't done a lot of on this show, albeit we have had some Alberta investors have talked to to those downturns, but no one that's really talked about hard times in Ontario. And they have happened and they certainly could happen again. So it was a really valuable conversation. Um, Aaron has a lot of wisdom from, from the many years in the business. So he has a background as a chartered accountant, which he spent most of his career doing. He's been a real estate broker. He's been in development and many other types of real estate uh, right back into the 90s and then more recently as well, which he is currently divesting of. So uh, I'm confident that you'll get something out of this episode and it'll give you a slightly different perspective that, than that which you came in with. And uh, as always, if you're new to real estate investing, I highly recommend going right back to episode one, which are very fundamental episodes in those first 10 uh, to give you a basis and to help you get comfortable with the terminology being used on this show. So if you hear things you don't recognize, that's that's probably the, your best bet to make sure that you're following along. And of course, you can always grab a copy of my cash flow spreadsheet, which is on the website, andrew-hines.com. As always, I'd like to ask you to please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell so that you'll always get notified every time there's a new episode. And I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a comment and let me know what you think. Thank you so much for tuning in. Without further ado, here's episode 118 with Aaron Mathur. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Aaron Mathur on the show today and he's going to talk to us about his story in real estate. So Aaron, I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you tell us what it is that you do in real estate investing and uh, where you're at right now. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. So nice to speak with you. Uh, I've seen many of your podcasts uh, really well done. I wanted to congratulate you for how practical it is. Thank you. Um, so my real estate journey started uh, rather abruptly and probably negatively. When I was a university student, uh, I had exams and all of that. My father had a house that we had rented. He left the country. He went overseas. So some of my early experiences actually were very negative, where I was handling 10 tenancies, evictions. I was handling a lot of problems when I was a student. I had exams. We actually ended up selling my dad's property at a loss just because I was leaving town and, you know, we, we had a lot of problems and all that. So that was then way back in the 70s. Um, my my um, adult life basically revolved around becoming a chartered accountant. Uh, I did work for a number of years in EY's Toronto office. And my career path was to build on my chartered accountancy and all of that. So quite accidentally, I ended up meeting Mac Champsey, who became my mentor. He was a CA from India. He became a, a commercial real estate broker. So through that uh, chance meeting, I ended up actually leaving the accounting career, becoming a commercial real estate broker. We ended up doing some very, very exciting real estate deals. Um, so I was a young person, didn't know anything about real estate at that time. Uh, we ended up uh, doing commercial deals. I ended up doing large scale multi-residential deals. Uh, I ended up focusing on land rezoning and land development. We did that for a number of years. And um, then uh, we had 1990. Now, of course, 1990 is a long time ago, but we had a downturn that lasted seven years, right? So 1990 to 1997. And I was into land development, land rezoning. So um, we ended up actually liquidating and more or less getting out over a number of years. Uh, I went back into the accounting profession, but the knowledge I gained is kind of inside me. So the real estate experiences, how to make money, how not to lose money. So I ended up getting into investment real estate on my own. And um, I, I bought three properties uh, in the last little bit. One is a, a single family home in Windsor. 
One is an eightplex in Windsor. Then we bought a condo up here in GTA area. And um, so I've done like the large deals. I've also done the smaller deals. Okay. So the, the most recent ones you said in Windsor, you've got, was that multiplex, did you say? I have an eightplex in Windsor, okay. which is residential. Uh, okay. I have a single family home that I bought. And uh, I bought these because I knew the real estate values were very low. The market had been in a downturn in Windsor for like 10 years. And um, quite interestingly, both uh, the, the house I actually did see, I went to, to meet the owners. I did the deal myself. But the eightplex I did without seeing the property, without an inspection, without an appraisal. I was sitting here in Markham. Uh, I was lying in my bed one evening and looking at the internet and this property came up. Uh, I called the agent at, at 8.30 in the evening saying that I wanted to buy this property. And he said it was already tied up and there was a conditional period for 45 days. Uh, basically he's telling me like it's not available. And I said, no, I'm ready to buy this property firm with no conditions, uh, all cash, deal, um, that kind of um, clean deal. Uh, we did an offer by 10 o'clock the next morning. He had 72 hours to get rid of the other deal. And I ended up buying it like, just like that, right? What so gave it was you, that cheap. What gave you the confidence to go in? I mean, you're kind of just getting back into real estate investing. What gave you the confidence yeah, to yeah. go so, in? So, sight so Andrew, the thing is, um, you know, anything that you do for a long time, you build up like a gut feeling, you build mm -hmm. up your instincts, right? So yeah. definitely when I started my real estate career, uh, I remember talking to Mac Champsey, who was my uh, mentor, like, how do you determine the value of a property? How do you recognize a good deal? So I used to ask these questions. Uh, in this case, because I had done so many transactions, I had seen good times and bad times. To me, intuitively, it was just such a strong feeling that I just said, okay, I'm going to do this, right? And I almost compared the property to land. I said, you know, the value of this property is below the value of the land. So whatever income I get, whatever condition the building is in, I'm kind of prepared to, to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely the realtor in Windsor was totally shocked, right? Like we did the, the deal by 10 o'clock the next morning, I sent a e-transfer for the deposit, very clean deal. And I, I'm sure he was totally shocked. Like this is way back, this is about eight years ago when the market was pretty much dead, right? It's oh, not okay. like the current market, right? The current market is very active. There's multiple offers, right? So I had the confidence because I, uh, I just had like a developed a gut, right? A gut feeling. So I didn't do any kind of comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do any projections, none of that. Yeah, well, eight years ago in Windsor, yeah, you must you must be cash flowing nicely on that one now. It's actually a phenomenal deal. I've spent a lot of money in fixing the property. We've replaced the furnace in 2019. I actually have have it on the market. We have an offer that came in yesterday. So you're selling so it now. I'm I'm selling it now. Just you know, because of my age, I'm trying to focus on corporate training. Uh, the property management I do myself, so it consumes a fair bit of time. So we have a very, very good run. Like we, uh, we've spent a lot of money and improved the property. Uh, along the way, the market has also mm -hmm. changed, right? So we've decided to to cash in. And what what's the what's the plan now? Because I think you said you have three properties right now. I have including three that properties. One. Yeah. Are they all multis? You said you have one single family home, and then you have yeah, the eightplex. Yeah, there's one condo, one single family home, yeah. and then this eightplex. Okay. So the two properties in Windsor, I've decided to sell both of them. So the the eightplex, um, the offer came in mm -hmm. over the weekend. We actually signed it back yesterday. So. Uh, I'm expecting the sale will happen in the summer. Okay. We'll take our gains and, you know, half, <clears throat> half of it is taxable, half of it is not. So you get a, a good chunk of cash in your hands, right? So that's right. our motivation. Well, the key question now is what do you do with that money? So you're a CA, so your, 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 your days are still very obviously busy. Uh, you have lots of work to do. You, you don't want to be right. managing your properties. I get that. Um, what do you do with that money now, though, in the market that we're in with the inflationary environment that we're seeing, you know, right. how do you how do you protect those dollars? 
Uh, good point. Good point. And this is my whole concern, right? Like we don't want to sell something which will increase in value in the future and then mm-hmm. park it in a GIC or something, which, you know, yeah. you'll get less than the inflation rate. Right? Absolutely. <clears throat> so it's actually a downward kind of a thing. So to answer your question, I'm actually kind of semi-retired. So I'm focusing on uh, corporate training. I'm focusing on um, speaking in conferences. I'm speaking, uh, I'm working on online courses and, and that side of my life, which is very, very exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, the property management, if it had been, if I could download the property management to a reliable person, probably yeah. I would still continue owning. But we've had some, we've had some really good tenants. We've had some bad tenants. We've done evictions. Um, so, so when you deal with, um, you know, some of these late night issues and you deal with, uh, uh, let's say, irresponsible tenants, uh, that takes a bit of a toll. It's also an out-of-town property, so mm-hmm. I'm not actually physically there. So that makes it a little bit harder for me, right? So our plan yeah. is actually to keep the Markham condo because we live in Markham, and we can also see that, you know, we might use that for future retirement. We might actually live there, um, and that's like an easier thing to manage. We've been very fortunate; mm-hmm. we have a really good tenant. Uh, so that's part of the equation for me. Uh, so as far as the funds, uh, we probably will pay off our debt. We would uh, probably park the money. And um, um, it's like a consolidation or it's the idea yeah. of simplifying our lives. That, that's kind of our motivation. So you're at that point where you can simplify. Now, what would be, so you're kind of getting towards that that retirement age. So you'll obviously be able to wipe a lot of debt clean with with what you get out of this eight plex. Um, right. maybe, maybe all of your debt what will you have kind of in retirement? Like, wh- how do you see retirement working for you? So to be honest with you, Andrew, um, I'm a really uh, workaholic kind of a person. Like ever since I was young, I've had two jobs and three jobs. And even as we speak right now, like I'm practicing as a chartered accountant. Uh, I run these three rental properties. Um, I, I have a training company. So I'm actually doing three different things. Uh, so I enjoy doing the things. Uh, I enjoy the challenge of working. Mm-hmm. Um, so I probably will slow down. I don't see myself retiring completely. Like I don't yeah. see myself, you know, like punching out and saying, okay, I'm doing nothing. So my, my retirement plan is to continue working on the corporate training, uh, to speak at conferences. Uh, I love gardening. I love playing golf. Um, we have children and grandchildren and the courses uh, a little bit for me are are almost like I'm talking to my kids and grandkids like we're trying to impart what we learned and share what we learned with others right so that's my kind of concept of retirement what are you what are you training on are you training related to being a CA or are you training on other topics so our training company basically revolves around business ethics so we talk about the return on investment from business ethics. We look at how can you improve the governance of corporate entities, not-for-profit entities, even the public sector. Oh, interesting. Those are the two main topics, but we talk about key performance indicators. Uh, I even do a course on public speaking. So this is like a very broad category, but it, it rests on ethics and governance and our target market are, are like business owners, uh, CPAs, um, so we're, uh, what I'm trying to do is to explain the benefits of ethical practices. And, and it's the same thing in my real estate course. Like I believe very strongly that we have to operate ethically and that's how you get the best return. That's how you remain in a business long term. So that's, sure. that's what excites me and uh, gets me up in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more. There's a lot of people who try and shortcut things when they're young because they think, oh, well, you know, who's, who's paying attention anyway, or, you know, you gotta, you gotta take advantage of your opportunities. And, um, I gotta admit, like I used to, to a little, you know, to some degree used to think like that. And I don't think like that at all. Like I I would never have wanted to hurt anybody, but uh, I really do just think, you know, act with honor. (laughs) Like if we don't have our honor, what do we have? Exactly. You know, one of the things I say in my course is that, you know, whether you're in business, you're in a profession, whatever we do, like we want our children and grandchildren to look at us, to respect us and and to look up to us. Right. So that if you're kind of cutting corners, if you're for sure cheating and ripping people off and all that, that's not going to happen. Right. So, and life is short, like we should do the right thing. We're here for the long term. Yeah. 
Uh, I do Absolutely. see the other side, though. I see people that don't have those values. And it always comes back on them. Comes, right? yeah. It always comes back. People think they get away with it. You don't get away with that stuff. Right. It comes back right. to you. Karma, yeah. karma will find you. <laughs> For sure. Um, <laughs> so you're, uh, you're an interesting one on this podcast. Not often I get guys on here saying they're getting rid of all their real estate, but uh, it, it, it does lead to a lot of questions. And uh, so you're teaching a real estate course now, uh, I gather, right. from what you just said. Right and um but you're getting out so tell me how's that so, gonna work yeah yeah so 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 you know andrew again it's it's kind of like um to be honest with you this is the decision we made in the last year and a half or so that we would get out when i bought the properties my actual plan was to just keep owning them right because this is mm -hmm. how investment property is yeah like over time you pay off your mortgage and your equity bills you can refinance and, and this is typically what most people do so when i was buying my plan was just to buy and hold like that's what we went into thinking about it. So my only reason for exiting is I'm kind of evaluating the use of my time and saying, you know, I could be working on new courses. Uh, I could be working in the professional practice in accounting. I could be uh, managing my real estate, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and again, I think it's partially because it's an out of town properties and, you know, it's harder to handle that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, um, so I'm kind of saying, okay, I've come to this level, I'll get a certain price, I'll take my gains, let the, let the next person take their gains over the sure. next 10 years, that kind of thing. Uh, probably if my kids were interested, that's another kind of angle. If, if any of my kids were interested in managing and handling and all of that, maybe I would have thought differently, but they're all busy sure. in their own careers. They're doing their own thing, right? So yeah. Um, that's another, uh, okay. I also see, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I don't want to be morbid, but I do see people that hang on to their properties. Like I see people at very late stage of lives. And this is kind of, um, to me, I don't want to be like that. I want to be mm -hmm. a little bit detached. Right. Well, so you definitely need to delegate, right? If you're yeah. self-managing yeah. in Windsor and I'm self-managing stuff in London and I'm in Florida right now, but if you're self-managing from far away, Which you got to have a team. Florida are you in Andrew? Where, where in Florida? Uh, Southwest Florida, like Naples. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. A little warmer down here and a lot a lot sunnier generally. For <laughs> but, sure. Uh, when are you and back a lot more town? open. <laughs> when are you back in town from Naples? I'm not sure. Yeah, we're, we're playing you're it. flexible. You can Yeah, we're just playing it by ear, yeah. 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 Um, all my work is remote anyway, so I'm very right. for fortunate that way. Um, but uh, lo losing my train of thought a little bit here, but yeah, you know, because I can I can work remotely and, and this is this is my point is that that you got to have a team and I'm assuming you do, you must sure. on, on the ground in Windsor because you, you yeah. don't manage from four hours away uh, without a team, even right. if you are self-managing. So I think a lot of people get that mixed up in their head. They think self-managed means I get the call in the middle of the night, but you don't need to do that at all. Like right. if you, right. if you have the proper emails and you have the proper notifications to your tenants, like you, you can literally just give them a call, like a call list. If this happens, call this person. If this happens, exactly. call this person. Exactly. I would still get my tenants call me sometimes, but I literally just text them back. <laughs> What's up? Right. Plumbing's right. overflowing. Here's yeah. the plumber's number <laughs> or just exactly. call the plumber. You have the number. For sure. um, so, and that's you know, exactly how it should like be. That. Right? So yeah. This is like a win-win, right? If you can arrange yeah. that. I actually, I had started my, my thing with that type of uh, setup, but my main property manager actually retired and said, you know, yeah. he's not interested. He had grandkids. He so that's part of the reason now. Take care of them and all that, right? Yeah. So I have, a, I have a different person helping me, but his role is very limited. Like he does just bare bones kind of work. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it comes to these kinds of things, like, you know, middle of the night issues and yeah. um, sudden issues that come up, I'm kind of entangled yeah. in that. And it's a little bit stressful for me because, you know, if I was younger, I probably would, would roll yeah. with the punches. But, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Naples because in my training company, that's exactly my vision is to travel the entire globe mm -hmm. and do my deliveries and do my, actually my daughter works, with, uh, two of my daughters work with me in my training company full time. So we were in Panama a couple of years ago um, for like a, an anniversary, like a celebration kind of thing. And I was actually inside the swimming pool of the hotel. She was sitting in one of the cabana chairs and we were talking about a course. So I said to her, somebody needs to take a picture because this is exactly what work should be, right? You should be able yeah. to sit in a pool and, and do your work. So that's like what you're doing is exactly my vision, but for the training company. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, you know, it, it's a life by design, right? Like that doesn't happen by accident. Uh, I think exactly. I say, I, I say no to a lot of things so that I can work sure. this way. Yeah. And uh, that's something I've had to 
glean because I've been, <laughs> I've been self-employed, you know, most of the time since I graduated university in 2008. So oh, that's fantastic. It's, it's been a little while. Um, so yeah, I've had to learn, right. I mean, initially I said yes to everything and then I, you know, I got right. very uh, right. unhappy in my, in life, you know, I, I was doing too much and, you know, feeling yeah. stressed and all that. So you don't want any of that, right. Interesting you say that, Andrew, because when I was a com full-time commercial realtor and I was much younger then, um, we used to work, like I used to work like through the entire evening, right? Mm -hmm. So even though we did commercial real estate, like you would think residential, the deals are done in the yeah. evening and all that. But with commercial real estate, uh, there are times when I worked like through the entire evening, I would drive home like 1130 at night, every night, right? Because this is like an active project, you have work going on, all of that. So one thing I realized looking back and reflecting on all of that, like we have to kind of contain our appetites, right? Like mm -hmm. sometimes you want to do every deal. Sometimes you want to do whatever comes in front of you. And as you know, like once you get into the business, people will bring deals to you, right? Yeah. So in a way, it's smarter to be selective and to do what you can manage versus spreading out and doing too much, right? Like doing six or eight active deals at one time. It really takes a toll, right? To yeah, that. active deals are tough. I, I, I really burnt out for a while there. I was doing like multiple student rental construction projects, building, you know, additions every two months on different properties and and then building like 27 townhouses on top of that and i'm like okay i'm doing i'm doing wow. a little too much and i i, I had to like scale that back because it just became like consuming just yeah. everything i was doing constantly getting phone calls from 7 a.m into the evening and no, no, not that that's that bad but i mean <laughs> some people are like oh boohoo but uh you know for me it's it's about what i think about you know how much of my mind space does it does it consume that's the real right. thing you got to protect right because if you're if you're constantly in transactional how do you ever think vision for the rest of your life vision for the big stuff right. and that's uh that's been a big growing growing thing for me for sure. So, so you know, one thing, Andrew, which which I find very interesting is I feel a little bit like the uh, indigenous uh, native leaders, right? Like when someone comes to the native chief and says, you know, what is your wisdom that you want to share? Now, with climate change, the, the natives say, you know, the native leaders say we have no wisdom to share because it's so different now, right? So in a way, I feel a little bit like that because one thing I'm seeing is that in the last I don't know, 15, 20 years, we haven't had a downturn in real estate. It's just been going up and up and mm -hmm. up, right? So my nephews, my nieces, my kids, uh, as they were growing up and becoming adults, they're watching the real estate line just rising every year. It's just such a strange phenomena. Um, what I hit in my time when I was doing all these active projects, we hit like a hard downturn in the market. It was painful. It was long. It lasted like seven, eight years where the market values went down. Right. Right. So I was doing active projects where we were investing money. We were doing rezoning. I was doing estate housing, golf course development. I was doing all these large deals. And these were these were projects you had ownership in. Yeah, yeah. I had yeah. a share of the ownership. We had a bunch of friends. We we came yeah. into different so deals. several shareholders Oops. in on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did very well. But when when what I'm explaining is when the market turned, and if you're lost you've got, at all, you feed into it. Money's only going out. Mm for coming in it really hurts right so i've gone through that but the younger yeah. people have not right they haven't seen oh yeah severe downturn oh yeah everybody in ontario thinks they're a genius right now but look yeah. at i bought a property look how much money i made they, they think yeah. it's like money printing machine which it sort of has been but I'll, I'll be the first to say i'm not a big fan of what's happening i i like steady i don't like explosive growth in markets because it makes them unpredictable and it yep. dries up cash flow because rents never climb as fast as property values. So um, this 30% a year thing, well, I guess oh. Canada, Canada as a whole was 17% over year over year, 2020 to 2021. But uh, it, this whole 30%, you know, like London, Ontario, 30% and, and yeah. Toronto, Toronto wasn't so bad. Hamilton was up huge. Why, you know, why that's happening? There's many reasons, but it's not sustainable. And well, for sure. And, um, you know, you have a course, you're teaching people on where to invest. Like that's, we're all scratching our heads right now, trying to figure out like, what is the right thing to do? Like a friend of mine's out in Alberta investing. I think that's a very, you know, a, a much more feasible market. The cash flow seems to work better. I'm looking down here, uh, for opportunities. I'm looking, uh, you know, open mind to different uh, markets within the United States that are, that are going to cash flow better than a lot of Canadian markets would. Sure. But sure. where, where are you focusing on? What are your fundamentals, you know, so, as a teaching philosophy? 
So, so Andrew, one of the things that I learned in my experiences is there seems to be like a disjoint between local knowledge and out of town knowledge, right? Absolutely. And, and let me explain what I'm getting at. Like quite often, if you look at a property and you take it to a local person or you're discussing with a local person, we have all this baggage in our heads of previous prices and previous values. We, it puts like a blinder, right? I'll mm-hmm. give you a quick example. Like I live in Markham many, many years ago. Um, we had a townhouse development down the street from our home. So it was covered in the media because people were lining up overnight. It was raining. It was that kind of frenzy to Mm -hmm. buy these townhouses. So I heard all this media hype. So a few days later, I went into the sales office and um, uh, just kind of chatted with the salespeople. And I said, you know, boy, you guys are getting such dramatic market response and all that, right? So they were selling townhouses for 485,000 down the street from my home. I had bought my home for 270,000, right? Mm-hmm. A few years ago. So this price to me seemed absurd. So I said, you know, the, why are people lining up for this, right? It was such a dramatic market that the builder didn't even put prices on the price list. He put the model and the square footage. The price column was left blank. They would write that in like during right, the yeah. Uh, because you know? it was so volatile. So, so, so here I am. I have, I'm a commercial real estate broker. I have all this buying and selling experience. And I looked at that and I said, this is absurd, right? Well, those townhouses are now selling for twice of what they were selling then, right? Right, yeah. So my local knowledge actually hurt me. Right. Yeah. And I had the same thing in Windsor. Like when I, I used to actually go to Windsor for work and uh, I have all this ability to evaluate the risk and to, to value a property, to understand the potential. I would say intuitively, I can look at something and say, here is what you can do with it. Right. Because I've done it so many mm-hmm. times. So there were two deals in Windsor. Uh, one deal was a commercial property with the retail tenants on a main arterial road. I had done many, many deals like this. So I looked at it, I valued it, I tied up the property. And um, I took it to three of our clients and said, you know, here's a very good real estate deal. You know, you'll make out like a bandit. Uh, why don't three of your friends join in and take one third each? And I was just being like a broker kind of role, right? Sure. So two of the guys were very excited. They were business people. The third one was a physician. So he sent his accountant to the meeting. He didn't attend himself. He was too busy. The accountant didn't really understand risk and risk evaluation, right? So when I did my cash flow projection, when I explained why I like the property, this accountant got stuck on the mortgage rate because I gave him the current mortgage rate for five years, right? That's how you do a deal, right? right? He said to me, what will the mortgage rate be? in year six. And I said, I don't know. The bank doesn't know. Nobody right, knows, yeah. right? Because nobody knows. It's an unknown, right? So he was stuck on that. Long and short of it is, so because this main partner didn't come in, the other two guys didn't come in. Then another one of their friends walked by my office and said, I understand you have a deal. This guy was very sharp. So he took 100%. He took the whole deal and, and uh, bought the whole thing. In five months, the adjoining property owner took 20% of our land and paid us almost 100% of the value, right? Of what oh, we paid. wow. Of what, what so was this paid became like yeah. an infinite rate of return. Yeah, yeah. Right? So what I'm saying, like sometimes this out-of-town knowledge helps, sometimes the lo- local knowledge mm-hmm. helps. Now what happened with the same physician, I found another property which happened to be land. And I, I took it to him and he said to me, you know, my accountant will get back. I said, no, I don't want to talk to your accountant. I want you to look at this, right? So... Um, he came back to me and he said, you know, you're from out of town. This is a rough end of the city. You don't really know the city like we know the city and whatever, right? So we dropped the deal because he would have been like a main partner Mm -hmm. because we would do like five or six people. I'm not exaggerating, Andrew. We dropped this deal after doing our due diligence and tying it up for like 45 So you had it tied up and you released it? I released it. The day I released it, the adjoining property owner bought this chunk of land for $500,000 higher than our deal. Than you were going to pay? Yeah. So, so, you know, sometimes the knowledge helps, sometimes the local knowledge helps. So I think, and you know, when you mentioned the U.S. is exactly the same thing. In our real estate office, uh, when I was doing the, the land development and all that, our folks went out to Texas, they went to Florida, they went to different places. So, 
I think that's a really good formula. You have some local knowledge, some out of town knowledge, and you yeah. state because yeah. uh, both both things are important. You know? Well, you have to acknowledge that they're real. It's a real thing, right? I, yeah. I remember in London where I was operating, I was buying stuff at two hundred thousand, and people laughed at me like, "Oh, you paid two hundred? You paid too much for that? Two ten? You paid too much for that?" I'm like. Yeah, I think I'm all right. But uh, I started to learn because I, my wife's from Burlington. So we, we moved up there and I started to learn that, that London was very, very cheap compared to other markets and their cash flow was good at the time. And um, I, so I was selling, I was, I was uh, renovating these properties and they were selling off market, not mine necessarily, but there was a lot of people that were renovating these properties and selling them in the 400s and people in London couldn't wrap their head around it. They, right. they would never believe that those houses could sell for that. So um, it actually served me because no one, you know, I was still buying inventory in the low 200s and, it, you know, getting right. valuations for 30 to 530. Um, and that was a, an advantage. It's almost like your out, out of town knowledge allows you a massive advantage. And, and I see that in Florida now when I'm looking in, in markets like Cape Coral where you can find duplexes. And when I say duplex, they call it that, but it's a semi-detached, it's a unit on either side in the right. 400s. You can buy in the 400s, brand new construction. And yeah. it's like, oh, you know, I like 2,600 square feet of living space plus a garage. That's right. really, really cheap compared to home. And here they think it's gone crazy. And it has right. for here. Right. So I try not to get too focused on any of that. I look at rents relative to uh, to purchase price. Cause otherwise I'm speculating. If I don't have my rents, I'm speculating. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's very interesting what you're saying, because one of the things I see right now is uh, people from big cities are moving into smaller areas because of work from home, this type of thing. So all of Canada, I'm not sure what's happening in the U S but all of Canada, uh, all these small towns have this influx of people wanting to live there, right? Something mm -hmm. they've never seen, right? In Newfoundland, New Brunswick, all across Ontario, you know, people are going into the cottage country to live, not just to vacation, right? Going into small towns and all of that. So this phenomena is a totally unexpected thing that is a byproduct of COVID where suddenly your demand is spiking, your prices are spiking. The local people like say Belleville, Trenton, uh, all these smaller places suddenly have all these guys lining up to buy all their properties. They've never seen yeah. that, right? Prices are going up. They can't afford that. Uh, Windsor apparently is the lowest price uh, average median price in all of, all across the cities across Canada and all the investors are coming into Windsor right now right so when I look at it I'm saying mm -hmm. that's a good thing right that's the time to sell when the market is that yeah eager to buy, right but is it is it not po poised for the most growth because I see Windsor as having had a lot of catching up to do and it's done a lot of that catching up over the last year and a half two years uh, yeah. just you know, astronomical it's, it's an property interesting growth. question because when you talk about fundamentals, the mm -hmm. fundamentals are like interest rates, employment levels, immigration mm -hmm. levels, quality of life, amenities, all these things. These are the fundamentals that drive prices and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you like, I've never paid like 18% mortgage interest, but I have paid 13.5% mortgage interest, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at the current thing, like I have a mortgage right now, which is 1.61, right? Like never in my life would I yeah. have ever dreamed that I would get a mortgage at 1.61, right? Because I've seen, you know, 13 and a half. I remember we, we renewed a, a commercial property mortgage a few years ago and it was being offered at 7.9%. We did a 10 year renewal because that was a bargain, right? We thought 7.9 mm -hmm. was a bargain, right? I think this is what's also driving the whole thing right now. Oh yeah. So cheap, right? The mortgage has come so down cheap. so low. It's almost yeah. down to zero, right? There's no other place for it to go. Yeah. The, the, the problem with this is uh, the, the affordability of lower interest rates has been offset by a climb in price and mm -hmm. And it's so expensive to build new construction. Now it's, that's also driving resale. Um, there's so many reasons. Then we have immigration. We have so many things driving price up right now. Uh, exactly. Eventually it, it's got to stagnate at very least. And then right. potentially, potentially we may see some, some sort of a correction. Like I keep, I constantly question this. I don't know for sure that we do. I think with the amount of demand for housing, it's hard to imagine unless people really got hit in their pocketbook, like lost their jobs. Um, yeah. So, so, so I'll tell you, then, like, then you could see it. Yeah. Yeah. See, predicting the future is very risky, right? So even COVID, oh, yeah. like if you look at small business, you look at the mm -hmm. restaurant segment, the event industry, you look at the travel industry that's been hit so hard 
it was not on anybody's radar, right? Like nobody said, okay, some government is going to shut down my restaurant or is going to prevent me from flying my plane or running my cruise ship. But COVID came out of the blue and did that, right? Mm-hmm. A little bit like 9-11, right? Like 9-11 happened. It was on nobody's radar as something right. happened. So when we look at what will make a market turn downwards or what will make a market go in the opposite direction, uh, people, people will say that nothing will, right? But I'm saying there are these external things that happen suddenly, right? Yeah. So um, uh, I, w- I, would, I would say that, you know, um, uh, l- let me tell you what I think, okay? What I think is Love we should try to predict mm-hmm. because it's impossible to predict, right? Mm-hmm. And as, again, as I'm saying, like we thought 7.9% was a bargain. We fixed it for 10 years, but now, you know, we look at it and say, oh my God, we should not have done that, right? So you can't predict, right? Absolutely. What I would focus on with real estate, whether you're, you know, my age or younger or whatever, is to look at how can you increase the value of the real estate? right that's the approach i take like in other words you look at a a condo you look at a townhouse you look at land you look at commercial property you look at a multiplex whatever property you look at my approach is to say what can we do to increase the value of this property regardless of the market right so if the market goes up like for example in my case in windsor i bought when it was rock rock bottom i bought the low end of the property so i couldn't see it going any further down right yeah So that's kind of timing helped me and I'm happy about that. But more important than that, I looked at the property and said, how can I improve this property? What can I do? right? So you look at insulation, you look at roofing, you look at improvements, you look at renovation, changing the fixtures, making it a better, uh, Mm -hmm. making it better for the tenant, right? So if you can make it better for the tenant, you can increase the rent, you reduce your expenses, that kind of thing. So that's always my approach is how do you increase the value of property and what can you do? So it's not uh, trying to luck into something, you know, if your timing is right, just like the stock market, If everything is going up, your property will go up as well, right? Absolutely. But if you can put that extra effort to improve the value, then you're mitigating your risk, right? So even if the market is not that great, you can still walk through it, walk through a bad market, right? But Aaron, what do you say to people today? Because I mean, most of my guests and listeners are on board with improving real estate, Uh, but there, there you have people that are buying and and doing a full burr. You know, when you you add the value and then refinance at the end, and they're probably best case break even cash flow maybe a touch negative when you actually factor in all the capital expenditures of of improvements down the road right is that in your mind a good strategy oh that's a tough question andrew um so it depends on your time frame right so if you have a short term time frame if you're saying i want to be in and out in 2 years i want to be in and out in 3 years it may not happen, right? Because I've even talked to builders, uh, like one of the things we did when I did commercial real estate is we would buy the remaining inventory from a builder when they were finishing and just buy the last 25% at a wholesale price, right? So I remember talking to a builder in Brampton, this is probably about eight, nine years ago. Um, And I said to him, I said, you know, if you want to sell the remaining thing, we could consider that. So it's like a way to mitigate your risk, right? From the builder's point of view, you take like a discounted price and you get out, right? Absolutely. Now, luckily the market has just been going up and up and up. So I would say, um, again, if you have cash flow, if you can hang in there, even if there's a downturn, it's going to dip down and come back, right? So in my major downturn that I faced, it was seven years. So, you know, when we were dealing with land development, we were putting money into it. It didn't make sense to keep pumping money for seven years, right? But um, I suppose if there is a downturn, if you have sufficient ability to hang in there, in other words, you don't have to liquidate, then what I'm saying is your returns will be delayed, right? So instead of getting your profit in year two, you might get it in year yeah. five or year six, right? Now, if you own your raw land, which is what I did, right? <laughs> then you don't have that option, right? Because nobody yeah. wants your land. You have to get out and you walk yeah, away. Yeah, you don't want to get get stuck mid. You, you can. Yeah. It gets tough when you're into a situation where you're in private money and you've maybe you've borrowed and you're almost at that point. And if the market drops right then, then yeah. you're kind of caught yeah 
uh, what the, what's the expression where you're swimming naked? Everyone will know when the tide goes out. Oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so, so I think I think there are two things here. So one thing is your appetite, right? If you have yeah. too many properties, that's going to come back to haunt you, right? Because you won't be able to handle well, it. too many properties like that, right? Yeah. Like and if you have cash debt. flow, then you won't you won't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the too much debt part is the big thing. Exactly. So if you, you know, have enough you cash flow, you don't mind writing it out. Exactly. So if you have property where you can handle the debt or there isn't too much debt and things go bad, you can kind of hang in there and say, okay, this is a rough period. We're going to walk through it. It might be two or three years, maybe four years and so on. And definitely like, you know, the interest rates is a big deal. Employment levels are a big deal. Uh, you know, just like the stock market, the real estate market has its downturns, but it goes back up, right? So long term, mm -hmm. it's going to go back up. It's the yeah. the question is, do you have the ability to hang in there? Yes, right? staying so it's power. Like margining, right? Mm -hmm. If you buy stocks and you buy them all on debt, and yeah. the stock goes down in value, then you're in trouble, right? Right. So, so maintain your equity position. Don't get too greedy. Uh, and, and the other thing I always say in terms of investments is work out your worst case scenario, right? Yes. So work out what happens if nobody wants to buy your property. What happens if yeah. you know your cash flow goes down? Um, you know, it's interesting, like, as I'm saying, the last 15, 17 years, we've had a rising market, rents have been going up, interest rates have been coming down. It's a phenomenal period for everybody, right? If you bought five condos or 10 condos, yeah. laughing, right? You're doing phenomenal, right? Especially if you're in like just regular money, family rentals. Yeah. yeah. So just, yeah. you need a little bit of caution again, because- yeah. You, I've actually seen three downturns in my life so far, so we know what that's all about. It makes you it makes you wise. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, not a lot of people have lost in real estate, but the ones who do have a special ability to to make decisions that are going to prevent them from losing again. And uh, yeah. you know, I'm one of those guys who's who've lost. I haven't been in the Ontario market in a downturn, but I've I've invested in the U.S. in the past and and lost sure. money. So I know what that's yeah. like. I've interviewed people from Alberta. They know what that's like. Uh, so it, it's great getting that perspective on this show. And um, yeah, just to, to reiterate the point there, I think, you know, I'll stress this all the time. If you're going to invest, you've got to invest for cash flow because like you said, we never know what's going to happen to the market. It could go up, could go down. Yeah. If we're, if we're leveraged to the max and we don't have cash flow, we are just speculating and it's worked out really well for people, but it works until it doesn't. And then that exactly. could be a lot of hurt. And this is exactly the thing. So, you know, um, low interest rates, rising prices, it's a phenomenal ride, but mm -hmm. we've got to maintain our, our appetite, right? Like don't mm -hmm. get too much into it and don't expect it's going to be forever. Um, so I think, you know, you and I have very similar kind of values and, and similar experiences, I guess. Yeah. And as I said, when we started, like, I love what you're doing, like your, your podcasts are so practical. And, you know, if someone is watching or listening, um, maybe even just one idea might be something that helps them, sure. right? And you exchange so many people's views and experiences, right? I think it's a really, really nice thing you're doing. Yeah. Well, it's a lifestyle, right? Like being a real estate investor is a lifestyle. And I think that the thing that people get, if they've listened to all the episodes and there are many people who have listened to all of them, which is awesome is right. you learn from the way all these different guests think we learn yeah. the things that we all commonly say to each other, the lessons right. we've all commonly learned. And hopefully that gets ingrained so that you don't have to make the mistakes that guys like you and I have made and the, the hurt that we've had to go through. For sure. Um, for that's, sure. that's the idea with it. And I think, I think generally uh, I've got a lot of feedback that that's the way it's helped people. So um, on that note, what do you think you could share right now? Is there something you could share with us that you think would be of most value to my audience? So uh, I can tell you one concept. I can, I can share a couple of ideas with, with your audience that uh, we've learned. And, you know, my, my mentor's name is Mac Champsey. This is his book here. I, okay. Uh, we're giving this away, I understand, to, to a certain number of people who, who watch this. Um, so he's written, he passed away two years ago. I'm going to share a couple of things that Mac has said and he's taught me and, I, and I've kind of applied that. So one concept is this idea of having a positive belief, right? The idea that we believe that the work we're doing is going to have a positive result, right? Mm -hmm. So I can tell you when I worked as a commercial realtor and you know we evaluate deals, we do due diligence, 
I would say maybe one out of 10 deals that I evaluated, we actually did. Mm -hmm. So the nine that you didn't do, you could, you could reflect on that and say, well, I wasted my time, right? Because I, I read the leases, I inspected the property, I talked about it, I created a package, I did all these things, checking out legal things, talking to the city and you know, doing all this very heavy duty work. And nine out of 10 deals, we don't do them, we just reject them, right? Yeah. So this idea that the work we're doing is going to benefit us is really critical. It's like a belief, right? It's, we have to have a positive belief, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so the work that we do in real estate, whether it's analyzing a property, valuing a property, looking for the property, negotiating and all of that, it's not 100%, right? Like not 100% of the things work out, but we have to say this is worth doing. Uh, and, and this is my experience, right? This is how you learn. This is how you find the right deals and all that. The second thing I believe, um, sometimes people feel that realtors know a lot and realtors will keep the good deals. They won't share the good deals with the investors. So let me tell you, as someone who was a real estate agent and a real estate broker, the realtors we met who did very large scale deals, who were selling, who were representing the sellers, buyers, whatever, to be very honest with you, I was not that impressed, right? The realtor's ability to identify a good deal is no better than the investors, probably worse, mm -hmm. right? Most likely worse. focus <laughs> is on earning the commission, right? Yes. They're transaction oriented. They just want to cut a deal, right? 100%. So don't have a negative belief that, you know, the good deals are not there to be had. There's tremendously good deals that are there to be had. Like I bought the, the house I bought in Windsor, I used to talk to my mechanic here in Markham. He was also from Windsor. We used to talk about real estate. We used to talk about, you know, the market being low in Windsor. And one day he said to me, he said, my wife's grandparents are moving from their home into a condo. They want to sell their home. I drove down to Windsor. I gave them their asking price. I did the deal by hand and gave them 100% of what they wanted. No terms, no conditions, no financing, all cash deal. Um, because this deal was there to be had, right? Now the realtors would know, but the realtors wouldn't have that same belief, right? So having a positive yeah. belief, I think is important. Uh, all the work we do, we learn from that, right? So don't be afraid of working, right? That's, that's yeah. how you're going to learn. Um, I think one of the other things that uh, Mac instilled in my, in my brain was um, there's no perfect deal, right? So someone looking for a perfect deal, like 100%, is never going to find it, right? So there are many deals that when you do your due diligence, you check things out, you say, okay, it's substantially good, but it's not 100%, right? So max rule of thumb was 90%. If you were 90% satisfied, go ahead and do the deal because otherwise you're looking for perfection. It's like the unicorn, right? It's not there. Right? It's the enemy of good. Perfection is yeah, the enemy yeah. of good. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we say, you know, do your due diligence, do your work thoroughly, you know, work out your scenarios, work out your budget and your numbers, make sure you can handle like a worst case scenario, but don't keep rejecting the deals. And there are people like that, right? Like accountants, lawyers, engineers are trained in technical things. So they have like a black and white kind of view, like this is good, this is bad, but life is not like that, right? There's a yeah. lot of gray area. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of guts required to, to make a decision. And the technical people like the lawyers, accountants, and engineers, nobody has taught them about risk valuation. They yeah. really don't know, right? It's the entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who know how to take risk and, and even how to lose. Well, and there's a qualitative element to that, right? It's not, yeah. a, it's not a quantitative only thing. Risk analysis is a lot about knowing say, yourself, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The other thing I would say is don't be afraid of failure. Like I mm -hmm. think we learn from failure. So someone who is averse to failure, who says, I don't want to fail, you're limiting your potential, you're limiting your life experiences. Uh, I would say fail often, fail early, fail yeah. when you're young, because that's what, how you're going to learn and that's how you'll get yeah. into a, a better thing. I guess the last thing I would say in terms of uh, you know, attitude and all that is to be ethical, right? It's very, very important to be ethical. I believe that if we're ethical, the really, really good deals will come to us. 
And yeah. it's almost like you'll feel like you're lucky, right? You'll feel like luck is on your side because you've been doing things in a yeah. honest and, and proper manner. And when I say ethics, I'm talking about how we deal with competition, how we deal with government, how we deal with buyers, sellers, everybody, right? Like we deal in an honest way. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, I think, the, the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. So to switch gears here, I know you... Uh you'd mentioned you wanted to give away some copies of the book. I'm not sure how many we had um, lined up, but uh, I think it was five. So yeah, what we'll do is we will, uh, the family, and this is Max's wife and Max's family is donating this book to the first five people who request from your podcast. I believe my daughter has also said that we'll give a 20% discount to anybody that wants to take my real estate course. So my real estate course kind of covers mm-hmm. Uh, my experiences, it, it looks at what kinds of investors should buy, what kinds of properties and kind of um, the, the learnings that we have. We talk about, you know, valuation, financing, we talk about different types of real estate. And then we finish with like a do's and don'ts kind of thing, like what things to to work on, what things to avoid. Mm-hmm. So it's actually the same as your podcast. It's very practical. We're kind of combining what we've learned. Sure. Um, I'm also explaining more of Mac Chamsey's values and, and his experiences in life. Um, he's done much bigger deals than I've done. And I've worked, uh, he was, he was really the reason I got into real estate. So sure. Tremendous, okay. tremendous value there. So, so the five, the five books, um, should they just send an email? I'm guessing. Um, yeah, yeah. So the first five will get. Us, yeah. You send us the person's email and address and all that, and we'll send that out to them directly. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll have them um, email your daughter directly. So uh, for sure, I'll put the email address to email then. So for anyone listening, if you'd like a copy of that book, if you're one of the first five, you'll get it. Uh, just send an email to the email address in the show notes. I'll make sure it's really clear, uh, clearly marked. And uh, hopefully you grab a copy of that book. And then I'm also going to put a link to your course if anyone wants to check that out. And there was a promo code given to me. Um, so the promo code is just my name, Andrew Heinz. If anybody uh, wants to take advantage of that and get 20 percent uh, discount so uh hopefully that's a perk for for some of our listeners that uh that are interested in that but uh i really appreciate this aaron it was uh it was nice to uh to get to meet you and um is there a place that people can follow you or are you on social at all or or so, should they just go to your website uh, uh they can go to our website uh, mm-hmm. ultimquest.com um and again this real estate course we just did so it just got put on last mm-hmm. week uh, we also do other courses i mentioned on ethics we do courses on effective meetings a whole bunch of other things that i've learned sure. during my my 40 years of working yeah uh, and i'm also on linkedin uh, we have okay. a linkedin presence personally we're just setting that up for the company as well awesome. for Alton quest uh, well, I'll, I think I'll give what you're them, doing, Andrew, is fantastic. Yeah. It's connecting people. And uh, it, uh, what I love is that you're sharing practical ideas. And that's exactly what my course is, is what things to avoid, what things to focus on so that over time, the people who listen to the course and who will act on it will reduce their losses and improve their returns. That That's kind of the whole approach. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, I, that's what it's all about. So however we do it, we got to make sure we get to... Uh, get a lot of experience, a lot of ideas in our brains and just absorb them over time. So, um, okay. Well, I will include your website address. Uh, again, it was really nice meeting you. Thank you for sharing uh, here today. Been nice meeting you, Andrew. And uh, yeah, I'll look forward to, uh, to hearing how you're enjoying retirement. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Nice talking to you, Andrew. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one.